Good morning, everyone. The program is about ready to start, and I'd appreciate it if you would take your seats as we begin our opening keynote. So please go ahead and take your seat. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You guys are so excited this morning. It's great to hear all the hustle and bustle. We had a fantastic national evidence-based practice forum here yesterday. We had leaders from 40 national organizations and federal agencies here with us, really just getting ready to launch some great action strategies and make terrific recommendations for advancing evidence-based practice throughout the nation. So welcome. I'm Bern Melnick, and I had a dream about 15 years ago for a national institute for evidence-based practice that has now finally, after 15 years, come to fruition. So we are just so, so, so excited to launch it formally this week. Well, we have a vision at Ohio State, and that vision is to be the healthiest university on the planet. So I have a joint position at Ohio State. I'm not only dean, of the College of Nursing, but I'm also Ohio State University's first chief wellness officer. And in that role, and in that role, I get the opportunity to spearhead health and wellness throughout the university. So, this meeting is not without exception. We have to have healthy meetings. So you will see there are opportunities for wellness spread throughout these two days. Now, I'm going to bring you the latest evidence on well-being and sitting. How many of you sit three or more hours a day? So almost this whole room, if you sit three or more a day, you increase your cardiovascular risk by 30%. If you sit five a day, that is comparable to smoking one and a quarter packs of cigarettes on your body. That is evidence-based, based on population health studies. So I encourage you, if you want to stand at times during this two-day wonderful summit, please feel free to do that. If you ask me, what's the leading cause of death in America? Technically, I would tell you it's cardiovascular disease. However, if we take into consideration all causes of death and disease, it's really our behaviors that are the number one killer. And what's sad about that is 80% of chronic disease can be totally prevented. 
with healthy lifestyle behaviors. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor today. Before and after each speaker that comes up here, I'd like you to give them active applause to stand up and clap. Standing ovation. Now, do you know how good it feels as a speaker to not only get a standing ovation after you talk, but before you talk? It's absolutely fantastic. Well, this past spring, the National Academy of Medicine launched a new action collaborative on clinician well-being. We are experiencing a public health epidemic of clinician depression, burnout, and compassion fatigue. Those of us that work in the evidence-based practice every day, we see evidence-based practice energizes people again. Job satisfaction goes up. I have the privilege of serving on the National Academy of Medicine's Action Coalition on Clinician Well-Being. And I would encourage you to Google this action collaborative so you can stay abreast of the wonderful national work we are doing to improve clinician well-being. We just finished through the American Academy of Nursing. I chair a task force on this issue. We just finished a national study of nurses' health across the nation. We have the first large-scale national data set that shows nurses in poor physical and mental health commit more medical errors. That is very significant because medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in America. And our hospitals and healthcare systems need to put more emphasis on wellness cultures, support for nurses, physicians, and other clinicians. So last on wellness, I'm going to give you an evidence-based recipe for how you can lead a healthier life and experience this much less chronic disease. So you only have to do these four behaviors to have that much less heart disease diabetes, depression, back pain. One, 30 minutes of physical activity five days a week. Everybody says, I don't have time to do that. And I say, sure you do. Six times during the day, can you just get up from your desk and do five minutes of jumping jacks? Or a quick walk around your building, that will qualify for 30 minutes of physical activity. Five fruits and vegetables a day, don't smoke, and everybody gets happy when I share this last evidence-based tip. If you drink alcohol, it's fine in moderation. The CDC says, one drink a day, if you're a woman, two a day, if you're a male. And everybody asks me, Bern, how big can that drink be? <laughs> and I always say, a standard serving. 
a standard serving. Yes. Also, add stress reduction to your daily routine. We have opportunities for that throughout the conference. We have chair massages that you can take advantage of. And lastly, sleep seven hours a night. So, I have long had a philosophy in God we trust but by golly, everybody better bring data to the table. And we really live by evidence-based decisions. That is so, so imperative. So I was passionate about evidence-based practice really when I started pushing this movement in Rochester, New York in the 90s. Oh, yay, thank you. We said, we're going to hold the first international evidence-based practice conference at that point in time. We did, and 40 people showed up. That's it. And all my well-meaning colleagues said to me, we're so embarrassed. We did this big international conference, and only 40 people showed up. And I responded, 40 people showed up? Isn't that great? But that's the kind of attitude. Any big dream is going to really attract skepticism, negativism. And you just got to put your dreams on the front burner and keep persisting through the character builders. So I don't have bad days. I have character building days. And it really helps your approach to what is going on. But I was passionate about EBP in the 90s. I became more passionate after almost losing my youngest daughter, Kaylin, in Australia due to non-evidence-based health care. She almost died of a ruptured appendix. She ended up with peritonitis, pelvic sepsis, bacteremia, septicemia, and nobody would listen to me because I'm a seasoned nurse practitioner, and I knew what was going on, I begged for simple ultrasound. Nobody would listen. So that's part of evidence-based practice, that patient input, family input, that we cannot ignore. Kaylin is in her third year of vet school here at Ohio State now. And she has a lot of pretty bad memories of almost dying in Australia. But she's got such a great attitude. And she now says, Mom, I'm so happy that my story and what I went through could help you advance evidence-based practice throughout the world because I do tell her story. So I want to get back to this point. Nothing happens unless first a dream. So when I was in Rochester, New York, and my dear colleague who really worked so hard with me to create this foundation in our field to really plump it, evidence-based practice in the forefront, Ellen find out over her hold, we had a big dream. We wanted this to become standard of care throughout every nook and cranny. My dream has always been by 2020, every nurse, physician, dentist, pharmacist, optometrist would have EBP in their DNA. But paradigm shifts take a long time to happen. 
cultures take a long time to change. But what I'm telling you is you can't give up when things don't seem to be moving. You got to keep your dreams bigger than your fears, bigger than uncertainties, bigger than the negatoids that'll be in your environment telling you why something can't happen versus that it can. So Theodore Gissel, I could tell you countless stories about people who overcame adversity to see their dreams come to fruition. This guy who wrote the first Dr. Seuss book got rejected by 23 publishers. What happens if he would have stopped at 23? Where would our kids be without the Dr. Seuss series, right? But he didn't stop. He kept going. And the 24th sold, that producer sold 6 million copies of that book. So I always say success is going from one failure to the next with enthusiasm, right? So get excited. Get excited when somebody tells you you can't or no or I won't fund that project, whatever it is. And you just say, I'm one step closer to a yes and keep the dream in front of you. So back to 2002, I'm at the University of Rochester. I launched a center for research and evidence-based practice there. And we took a proposal to the Helene Fold Health Trust to really help us advance evidence-based practice. My dream yet then wasn't as big as it became. So full funded that project. So then I go off to Arizona State University as dean in 2005. I find I was so blessed to find my wonderful colleague, Laurel Van Drum, who is my current Chief of Strategic Partnerships. I hired Laurel as my Director of Development. And I said, Laurel, there's a trust called the Helene Fold Health Trust. I got some funding for them when I was in Rochester. We got to go visit this trustee again and get more funds because I'm going to pitch a dream of a national institute for evidence-based practice. We get to New York. We're pitching this dream. And the trustee, Marianne Kraskans, who I'm so eternally grateful to, she said, Burn, we've never given any money to Arizona State. And the first thing, and basically the only thing we get money for is student scholarships. And I said, I'll take money for student scholarships here. So we got almost a million dollars for student scholarships. We kept pitching the dream, though, for the National Institute. Well, I got recruited away to Buckeye Nation. Laurel came with me, thank heaven, and we started making more trips to New York City. And the trustee said the same thing when I pitched the dream of the National Institute. We never give to Ohio State, so the first thing we got to do is student scholarships. I said, I'll take a million dollars here for that, too. And I did get that million dollars. But as soon as that commitment was paid off, I said to Laurel and my current wonderful director of development, Katie Trombitis, we got to go now. We got to pitch again. So I started pitching the National Institute again. And last August, the trustee looked at me and said, Bern, how much money 
would you need to launch that? Do you know that's music to your ears? And Buckeyes are very competitive. So we knew the largest gift the trust ever gave was six million. So of course I said six and a half million. And she looked at me and said, I think we can do that. And last spring, we were awarded $6.5 million to launch this terrific institute. So I want to thank Laurel. I, of course, want to thank my dear, very dear friend, Lynn Gallagher Ford and colleague, who I recruited to Arizona State to work with us in our center for EBP there. She left New Jersey to come to Arizona. And seven months later, I said, Lynn, how do you feel about moving to Columbus, Ohio? And she looked at me like I had three heads. But she wanted to pursue her dream to continue to build this wonderful enterprise that could have so much positive impact on healthcare quality and patient outcomes throughout the globe. And Lynn has done a terrific job leading what we are now leaving on the table, our Center for Transdisciplinary Evidence-Based Practice, which now has morphed to a higher level with the new Fold Institute. And then I do want to recognize my wonderful colleague, Ellen Finout Overholt, who edited our first book in the field back in 2005 in evidence-based practice. We've got an awesome team here now to continue to grow and to flourish. So we are so excited. So I want to, those of you who know me well, no, I love to motivate because motivation, enthusiasm, you know, I always say, even if you don't feel enthusiastic, act it because enthusiasm is contagious, just like stress. And we need so much more enthusiasm in today's world. So if you have a big dream, and you're getting a lot of negativity and skepticism about your dream. You got to get up every morning and you got to do this. Love that. So with that, I'm going to share with you now some very hot off the press findings um, from a national competency study in evidence-based practice. This is submitted for publication. You are the first set of people to actually hear and see the findings that I'll be presenting today. So everybody is familiar with the triple aim in healthcare, and that is patient satisfaction with the experience, and that includes quality, improving population health outcomes, decreasing costs. But about a year and a half ago, there was a big publication that came out that said, wait a minute, it's not only the triple aim. This needs to be the quadruple aim. And that needs to include 
emphasis on the clinician. That gets to their work life, their well-being. And what I want everybody here to really resonate with, evidence-based practice, and this is evidence-based, can get us all of those outcomes. And that is something that leaders have to understand because they want quality, safety, positive outcomes, but they don't recognize often that evidence-based practice can get us to the quadruple aim. So we didn't bring you here to depress you today, but I think it's important that we really say, here's the honest truth the evidence. Here's where we're at. Preventable medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in America. If you want to up your odds of dying today, get yourself admitted to a healthcare system. Now, how sad is that? But it's true. The third leading cause of death in America. We still have so much practice variability. Depending on where you work, we have some people who say, yes, I'm going to practice in an evidence bay. We have other people say, we do it this way because that's the way we do it here. Or that's the way some outdated 10-year policy without evidence says it needs to be done. We know, based on research, we could save the U.S. healthcare system 30% at least of what we're spending if every clinician across disciplines would practice consistently this way. And as I mentioned, 80% of chronic disease. One out of two people have a chronic condition in America. Think about that. And 80% can be prevented. But we still live in a sick care health care system. There is not enough emphasis on wellness and prevention. I tell my nurse practitioner students all the time, are you writing scripts for 30 minutes of physical activity five days a week? Are you writing scripts for take a baby aspirin if you fall in this certain age group every day? Are you writing scripts for five fruits and vegetables a day? We've got to swing this paradigm shift from sick care to well care. And we also, we also have to remember one out of four children, teens, and adults have a mental health problem today. One out of four, yet less than 25% get any treatment. And if they do get treatment, it's usually pills when we know, based on best evidence, for mild to moderate depression and anxiety, cognitive behavior therapy is the gold standard first-line treatment. But so many people do not receive it. I have spent 25 years of my research career developing and testing a CBT-based intervention that can't be delivered by nurses, by social workers, by teachers. So we get more people the help they need when they're struggling with depression and anxiety. So we don't have to argue this anymore. We know every clinician in America in the world, and I welcome our global folks because we have a lot of them here today.
but we know if we get evidence-based health care, our outcomes will be at least 30% better. Don't you want to see a provider who practices in an evidence-based way? And if we want that for ourselves, how can we turn around and deliver anything less than that? We have to teach the public when they go to see their primary care provider, they need to ask for evidence-based practice. They need to ask, are you an evidence-based healthcare provider? And if they get looked at with two heads, they gotta switch and go see somebody else because there are so many providers who are not practicing in this way. So evidence-based practice, as we know it today, integrates the best evidence from well-designed research, combines it with clinical expertise and patients' preferences and values. And when all of those come together, we make the best decisions that lead to the best outcomes. But we can teach clinicians how to do this. But if they go into a culture and an environment that does not support it, that doesn't have the infrastructure for it, their behaviors are not going to sustain. So the gap between the publishing of research and it's hitting the bedside to improve care and the outcomes remains staggering too long. I think in the nursing profession, there might be one or two percent of us that could say, we've spent 25 years of our career developing and testing these evidence-based interventions and people are actually using them in the real world to improve outcomes. It's still taking way too long. My own experience, I had conducted nine randomized controlled trials, some of which were funded by the National Institutes of Health to test my COPE program for parents of critically ill children and preterm babies. Across nine studies that I published up the wazoo, I presented all over the world the effects of this. It drops parent stress, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, improves child outcomes more than three years after discharge. So you would think People would read those outcomes and say, we need to bring that evidence-based practice to our NICUs and our PICUs. But after 25 years, not one hospital in the country was using that evidence-based program until I showed so what outcome. In our NIH-funded last study, we showed preemies whose parents got this program went home four days sooner. Eight days sooner for preemies under 32 weeks. What do you think happened when I published that outcome? My phone rang off the hook. How do we do this, Burton? Will you come and train us? It wasn't until I showed cost outcomes that anybody said, I want this program. Now it's being used all throughout the United States, in Switzerland, in the UK. But when I'd ask people, why do you want this program? People didn't say, for the wonderful developmental outcomes of the kids. They didn't say because it reduces parent depression. We want it because it reduces length of stay and cost.
for our healthcare system. Now, this is a golden nugget for everybody here today. If you're a researcher or if you're a evidence-based quality improvement person, if you are not measuring hard so what outcomes that the healthcare system currently really places value on, you are not going to stand a prayer at making practice change. And that's the reality we live in. We still measure way too many warm and fuzzy outcomes. And by still doing that, you're going to have a heck of a time seeing your programs, evidence-based, implemented in the real world. And then on the other hand, we still have practices like this without any evidence spreading all throughout our country. You can Google this. This was on 2020, this past year. A surgeon in California sewing a plastic little patch to the anterior of the tongue with six stitches for $2,000 and having to remove it after 30 days or it begins to adhere to your tongue. People are flocking to that surgeon for this procedure for weight loss. This surgeon was interviewed on national TV and a reporter said, what's your evidence behind this? And do you know what he responded? Why well, have anecdotal evidence it's working for the people that I'm treating it with? Anecdotal evidence. Why the Sam Hill do practices like this without any evidence spread like crazy and we can stand on our head and jump up and down and can't get practice change to happen based on best evidence. What's the definition of insanity? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. We have got to stop this because we know EBP can get us to the quadruple aim. We know the seven steps of evidence-based practice. We know how to teach people to do the process in an expedited way. See, one of the big problems we have, we have wonderful PhD researchers do great work, but they're teaching students at the bachelor's and master's level, still the rigorous process of how to do research instead of how do we teach these students to do the seven steps of EBP in a time efficient way so when they get out, they truly believe they can do this. They can do this. So when we don't have enough evidence, we got to generate it. And the PhD prepared folks are the people that need to be generating that evidence. The DNPs, the master's prepared folks, the bachelor's prepared, they need to do EBP. They need to know, how do I take findings from research, translate them to the real world to improve outcomes for my patient. And then the other big problem we have, or I should say character builder, <laughs> is so much our, of our evidence is still down toward the bottom. We are still doing so much single descriptive work. We describe things to death. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do qualitative and descriptive work. I'm not saying that at all. When we don't know something, 
about a construct. But when we've got enough, let's do intervention work. Let's do randomized controlled trials, pragmatic clinical trials. Let's do more of that to generate high quality evidence that can drive our practices. So back in 2003, the IOM's committee on the health professions education set, all healthcare professionals will be educated to deliver care in an interprofessional team emphasizing EBP. They also set a goal, 90% of the healthcare decisions will be evidence-based by 2020. We now have a national center for interprofessional education, right? Everybody's aware of that. We have four core competencies. Yesterday, I said to the group, of leaders who came in for the forum. We need to write now a letter to the director of that national center saying evidence-based practice needs to be the fifth core competency across all professions. And we can help you do that. We really can. So do you remember in 2005, a big study was published in the American Journal of Nursing that set in a big box the conclusion, U.S. nurses are not ready for evidence-based practice. So seven years later, our team said, we're going to do a study on the state of EBP to figure out where we're at. So we randomly sampled 1,000 nurses from the American Nurses Association on their evidence-based practice beliefs, implementation, barriers, facilitators, and the findings were pretty disheartening. The older the nurse, and the average age of a nurse now is 47, so they didn't grow up with EBP. They grew up with research. So the more years in practice, the less nurses were interested in and wanted to learn more about EBP. So even if we do the best job of teaching our students and they get out in the real world where they don't see people practicing this way, what do you think's gonna happen? They're going to slip into that's the way we do it here. We're going to fall in line. We got to teach our students how to be prepared for that. Only a third of these nurses said, we have access to evidence-based practice mentors who can guide us, who can mentor us in how to deliver evidence-based care. And we asked them, What's the one thing that prevents you from delivering EBP? We knew time, culture, all of that has been described and described for 20, 25 years. But there was a new barrier that was found in this study. These nurses said, our managers and our leaders are preventing us from doing this. So I got a call from Michelle Troseth, who's here with us today. She's president of the National Academies of Practice now. And she was working for Elsevier at the time. And she said, Elsevier's really troubled by that fifth barrier. So will you consult with us and help us to do a study with leaders and figure out what, where they're at with evidence-based practice. So our team did that study with 276 chief nurses from across the United States. Now, what's really interesting about these 
findings, which we published last year, the chief nurses told us, we believe, we believe in EBP. We believe. <laughs> we believe in EBP. But their implementation of evidence-based practice themselves was really low. In fact, over half of these chief nurses said, I'm not sure how to measure the outcomes of the care that's being delivered in my healthcare system. And then we asked them, to what extent is there a group of nurses in your hospital or healthcare system that has strong knowledge and skills in evidence-based practice? Almost 80% said not at all to somewhat. That's where we're at. We have so much opportunity in front of us. And then we ask them, what are your top priorities as a chief nurse? Not surprising, quality and safety were ranked number one and two. But evidence-based practice was at the bottom of their priorities. We had the biggest aha moment. We said, oh my gosh, there's a huge disconnect here. They want quality and safety, but they don't realize evidence-based practice is the direct route to get them to quality and safety. So I called the CEO of the American Organization of Nurse Execs, and I said, Pam, I have hot off the press data with chief nurses. It's pretty disheartening. We got to educate these people. So can we do a summit with chief nurses at the next AOME conference? And we did that with 160 chief nurses. And you know what they told us? Fern, you got to remember, we went through our educational programs 20 years ago. We didn't learn this. We can't support or invest in what we ourselves don't know. Same thing with faculty across the United States. They can't teach this if they themselves have never done it, right? So we've got a lot of education still and skills building to do. It was not surprising then to see 30 to 40 percent of their hospitals were not meeting benchmark on ND and QI measures or core performance metrics because they didn't have a critical mass of people that were functioning and practicing in an evidence-based way. So our team said, you know what? We don't have competencies that exist for practicing nurses and advanced practice nurses. And we not only have to get a group of national experts together to draft them, but we then have to gather the evidence in a research study behind these competencies. So in 2014, we published the first set of evidence-based practice, research-based competencies, 13 for bedside clinicians and another 11 for advanced practice nurses. If you have not seen these yet, I would encourage you, download that paper that has the competencies. It's freely downloadable from the Worldviews Journal website. We have people downloading these like crazy, but people have to do more than download them. They must use them. They must say to their clinicians when they hire them, 
Here are the 13 evidence-based practice competencies for practicing nurses. If you don't meet them right now, you have a year to meet them. For advanced practice people, same thing. So ANPD did a study with their nursing professional development folks. They repeated basically this study and they found very similar findings as we found in this national study. So these are the hot off the press findings. We just did a national study with 2,300 nurses from over 20 hospitals and healthcare systems all throughout the country. So these are not published yet. We wanted to see where nurses would rate themselves on these competencies. And I want to remind you, in these kind of self-report surveys, people usually over-report what they can do, which makes these findings even more troublesome. So here's what we found. We looked at relationships amongst EBP culture, knowledge, beliefs, and mentoring. And what we found was there was a significant relationship between an evidence-based practice culture and people saying they're more competent in EBP. Knowledge was also significant related. But the strongest relationships with competency were a person's beliefs about the value of EBP and their beliefs about their confidence that they could do it. But the strongest relationship that we found in this study was the mentoring that they have in evidence-based practice. If they had strong mentoring, they reported higher levels of competency. Out of 24 competencies, overall, this group reported they were not meeting any of them. None of them. They reported they needed improvement on all of these. And then we looked at the differences by degree. As you can see from this slide, we were disheartened to see there was very little difference in reported competency between associate degree nurses and bachelor's degree nurses. There was a wider spread between the bachelor's and the advanced practice folks, which we would expect but the only competency the master's folks said they were competent in was questioning clinical practices. Are you surprised at these findings? Some of you are shaking your heads no. Some of you are shaking your heads yes. I was hoping, again, by 2020, I wouldn't have to run around the world teaching people how to do this anymore. If I'm blessed to live to 90 or 100, I think I'll still be running around the world <laughs> teaching people how to do this, how to build cultures of evidence-based practice to sustain. We also did a structural equation model to see what predicted competency and then implementation. And our biggest predictors were knowledge, beliefs, and mentorship, which took a big bite out of competency. And that's something Ellen and I have been promoting 
since the late 1990s when we developed our ARC model. You've got to have a critical mass of evidence-based practice mentors throughout your system. If your point-of-care clinicians are going to do this, and they're going to sustain it. But the other wonderful finding in this structural equation model was if you have an EBP culture in place, that leads to job satisfaction. That leads to intention to stay. So culture is critical, but culture takes time. So again, we've got to make use of these competencies. We've got to prepare our students to meet them. We've got to set it as standard in our healthcare systems for our clinicians. And we got to teach EBP, not research, in our bachelor's, master's, and DNP program. I want to show you how confused our profession remains about what DNP should be doing. Because I've consulted with a lot of programs across the country who are still having their DNPs do research projects for their end project. This book was delivered to me last week. The third edition, and not only that, I was asked to do a review on it. Now, I believe in giving constructive feedback, <laughs> like an Oreo cookie. But I will be very honest, because this book's all about how do you design a randomized controlled trial? How do you design a good qualitative study? So we've got a long way to go, and we've got to focus on ROI. We have to start measuring in our evidence-based quality improvement projects, in our research. We've got to look at cost outcomes and so what outcomes. What really matters right now to the real world healthcare system? And then we got to remember, Culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I will tell you, again, you could have great clinicians steeped in EBP, but they got to live in a culture that thrives, that supports them to do this work. But here's the issue. The only people like change are babies with wet diapers. People don't like change. As soon as you come in as a leader and say, we're going to be the best in the world in evidence-based practice, people get all jiggy. And then their fear kicks in, and they resist. The number one cause of resistance is fear. People are afraid. You got to sit down and you got to say to them, I see you're resisting this change. Tell me what's scaring you. And many times that helps. So, again, Ellen and I have worked on this model for almost 20 years. Do you realize we have about nine evidence based practice models that are out there that are promoted? The majority of them are not evidence based. They're process models. This is a system-wide model. We have about seven studies now that support when you've got a critical mass of evidence-based practice mentors, clinician beliefs go up. They can do this. They implement more. And there's better outcomes for both patients and the clinician. And we just published the results of implementing this model with a hospital in the San Francisco Bay Area.
They were so thrilled. And this was transdisciplinary. This wasn't just preparation of nurses. It was nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, physicians. So when you have enough people who are skilled as evidence-based practice mentors, you're going to have great outcomes, and you're going to sustain them. So one of my dreams was to bring together many national organizations and federal agencies to present this data and, most importantly, say action-wise, what are we going to do about it? We have so many think tanks that happen, that white papers come out, and then nothing happens. And I said to the group yesterday, we cannot be another think tank where nothing happens. So we're going to be gathering commitment statements. We have asked these leaders from all of these organizations, and they were interprofessional, which was great. Go back to your organizations. Share what we just talked about. Strategize with your organization. What can you do to elevate this to the next level? And then what can we do in partnership versus silo, 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 and more silo? So before the forum, we did a survey because we wanted to see where are all these leaders at, right? And I want to finish by showing you a little bit of this data. So on a scale of zero, meaning poorly, to 10, how well do you think the U.S. healthcare system is performing in the consistent implementation of EBP? 76% of these leaders responded zero to five. Now, we had some optimists in the group, which was great, because we said, how many more years, how many years do you think it takes to translate these findings into clinical practice to improve outcomes? 57% responded 11 or more years, but 43% responded under 11 years. So I love that sense of optimism. But then they saw the data from the National Competency Study. And some of them said to me, I think I changed my mind now after seeing the data. What percent of healthcare providers do you believe consistently implement EBP? 78% said 50% or less on a scale of zero to 10. How well do you think students in the health professions colleges are prepared to consistently deliver EBP by the time they graduate? 51% said zero to five. In your organization, what percent of your budget is invested? in evidence-based practice, almost three quarters set, 10% or less. So again, lots of room for improvement. And we will share these slides up on our website, but I wanna finish by showing you what this group of leaders said. What can we do right now to advance this throughout the country. The number one response several times was we got to link this more to reimbursement. Now, the Affordable Care Act says we're only going to reimburse in primary care for USPSTF recommendations. So that's great there. But there's a whole other healthcare world out there. Clinicians often are motivated by if they get money to do certain practices. So how can we influence policy? Interprofessional education came up 
over and over and over again. Leaders making this a priority in their health care systems. Leaders saying, we will not accept any other practice here except evidence-based practice. So what do I think the future of EBP will look like? By 20, now 30, instead of 2020, EBP is in the DNA of every practicing clinician and educator. 100% of healthcare decisions are evidence-based, which includes patient preferences and values. Reimbursement, and there's no time lag. Once we see a systematic review published that's level one high quality evidence, bam, the country changes practice and it's implemented. But what will it take? We must slay all the sacred cows that are currently out there. We must do it. And we have to have the courage enough. We got to help our clinicians to have enough courage to stand up and say, this practice is outdated. We can't function this way anymore. And we need leaders who will say, I will provide the support and infrastructure and the culture for this to happen. And we need to get our faculty who teach these students taught how to teach evidence-based practice. So I always ask this question when I end a talk. If I could be your fairy godmother today and give you any dream or wish you could accomplish in the next two years, what will you do? if you know you cannot fail. And we have studies that show if you do nothing in the next 90 days after you attend a conference, chances are nothing's gonna happen. So the next 30 to 90 days is critical for action. And then what's the smallest evidence-based practice change you can make tomorrow that will have good positive outcomes for the people that you care for. We've got to eliminate, we have buttons we wear all the time because we've always done it that way with a slash through it. So if you tweet, I'm asking you, tweet some stuff during the conference at hashtag Fooled Summit. And then follow me on Twitter at Bert Malnick for daily doses of motivation and inspiration. Keep dreaming, discovering, and delivering evidence-based practice. Thank you. So we'll take 10 minutes and be back in here. So we'll shift it by five, 10 minutes.
right, hello. Now that we've had a wonderful couple minutes to uh, network, let's have you come on in and take your seats. Wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna get started on our next presentation, which is our panel. We have a few announcements that we want to start with. I'm trying to get those people to mouth up. If you ever need people, somebody to get people back in the room, call Kathleen. Her, her voice carries. She's one, one of seven children, is that right? No, I think the young, the oldest girl. Yeah, so she really doesn't even need a microphone, quite frankly, so. Okay, I have a couple of announcements for you before we get started with our panel. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is, uh, it came up yesterday at the uh, expert forum that we had and um, <clears throat> something we just want you to be aware of. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about evidence-based practice, and who isn't after listening to Burn, right? Um, we wanted to let everybody know that we do have what's a MOOC. Has everybody heard of a MOOC? Which is a massive open online course that we offer. Um, and it's pretty much me and Burn, and it's called the Foundations of Evidence-Based Practice for Healthcare Clinicians. It's free. It's, you just like register and you're in. Uh, the MOOC that we offer is uh, six modules. You can register and participate in it. it we run it twice a year. Uh, the current one is running as we speak. It will be running until uh, a couple more weeks, into November, oh, until November 18th, it's live. So you can register it for now, into it now, and then if you register into it, you have to register while it's open, even if you don't wanna watch it right now, but you can go back and see the whole thing but not live, you know what I mean? So register now so you have access to it. We offer it spring and fall. Um, and so everybody that's here, we're gonna be sending you a link, uh, it, probably next week, not tomorrow, probably next week. So you just click on the link and you can register and then you have access to the MOOC forever. And in, so we've been running it uh, for about, maybe about a year and a half, I think. We've had 4,200 people participate from 40 countries. So it's very cool. It's like a midwife from Ethiopia is talking to like a physician from Minnesota, you know. I learned how to say that from, where's Sharon Tucker from? She's from Minnesota. I was in the airport there the other day. I called her, I was like, everybody talks like you here. So, <laughs> Minnesota. Okay, uh, so that's the MOOC, all right? That's one announcement. The next thing is, anybody who wants to get continuing education credits, uh, you have to sign in on the sign-in sheet. And you also have to give us your email address because that's how we'll get you the evaluation form. So you have to sign in and do your evaluations in order to get your CEs. If you don't sign in, that's a problem. And if you don't do the evaluation, you still won't get them. So you gotta do both. So we need you to sign in and you have to give us your email, all right? The other thing is, I talked last night at the reception about the fact that we have a, out at our, uh, desk out there, one of the tables out there. We have a red box and we have um, these cards that say, uh, what's your question? We're trying to collect clinical inquiry, which is the first step to EBP. And the one competency that everybody seems to have, they know how to ask questions. So, <laughs> so we should keep up with the crowd. So they're out on the table. Please write your interesting questions down. We're gonna collect those and then we're gonna kind of, what are the questions that are driving everybody crazy out there? Um, as of yesterday, it, the decoration on there is, uh, we named him Pico the Flying Pig, but after we heard from General Hogg last night, we're officially changing the name to Pico the Flying Hog. So. <laughs> I know who to be friends with, so, you know, the new Surgeon General, we're on it, yeah, okay. So, the <laughs> Pico the Flying Hog, it has a nice ring to it, don't you think? I think so. <laughs> And the other thing is, as you look at the posters, our wonderful posters outside, we have a ballot out on that same table. Please uh, fill out a ballot and vote for your favorite poster. Um, the, uh, and vote once. <laughs> we do this at the immersion. I'm like, if you vote twice, it starts to be algebra, and 
too much math. So vote once, and the other thing is put your name on the ballot, because for those of you who vote, you're eligible for some fabulous prizes also. But if you don't put your name on the ballot, we won't be able to pick your name, and they're really very nice prizes that we um, have put together for you. So there'll be poster prizes for poster people, There'll be, po there'll be prizes for poster voters also. So please vote so we can have a little bit of fun um, celebrating and acknowledging our, uh, our poster presenters um, tomorrow. Okay, so that's the announcements. Now we're moving on to our, uh, our expert panel. Uh, this is a panel of folks who uh, uh, are here to talk about, the, uh, kind of get, summarize the work that we did yesterday with our expert forum. Uh, Byrne mentioned this, we had uh, all those organizations that were up on the slide she had up here, 40 organizations, uh, national organizations, professional nursing organizations, government organizations, uh, clinical uh, geniuses from all around. It was just an amazing, amazing day. And we spent some time together, uh, all together, and then we broke out into uh, four different groups, uh, clinical group, academic group, implementation science group and a policy group. Um, and we uh, got into smaller groups to really talk about where are we at with evidence-based practice. And each of the small groups had uh, uh, discussions that involved uh, questions about what are the current barriers relative to you know, your, this area of clinical practice? What are the strategies to get beyond barriers? We tried to spend more time on strategies for success than too much time on the barriers. We also talked about what kind of things can, can, what can the FOLD be doing to partner with organizations to move the agenda forward. And we also asked every group to help us with what do, we, what do you believe consumers need? What should we build for consumers? Uh, because one of the things we envision for the FOLD is it will have these cores. So there'll be the clinical core, which I'll be the director of. There'll be the academic core, which Cindy Zellifro, I don't know where she is, but she will be the director of. Sharon Tucker will be uh, leading our, our translation implementation science core. And then we're going to also have a consumer core. And um, we want to, we need to build that core. So we ask all the groups to tell us, what should we build? So what we're going to do this morning is uh, we had, uh, each of us had a fabulous co-chair that helped us at our um, sessions. And we took copious, our scribes, wherever they are, thank you scribes for doing such a great job of writing down all the amazing things that were being said. And then we kind of summarized yesterday uh, the core findings of each group and we're gonna bring those to you today and talk to you about what each of the groups really um, talked about and then hopefully have a little bit of time also to talk about uh, some of the synergies that we felt immediately between the groups and some of the action items for moving forward. So that's what we're gonna be doing for the next uh, couple, about 45 minutes, and um, hopefully we, I have somebody keeping time in the back. Where's our timekeeper? Okay, there you go. Kim's in the back, so. She said, do I need to give you help getting started? I was like, no. She goes, how about stopping? I said, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so we're officially starting, and then we'll watch Kim to tell us when we're done. So the first person I'm going to introduce, I'm going to have these folks give you a little bit of, you know, as they, um, talk to you, tell you who they are and what organization they're from, a little bit of background, and then they will summarize um, what, what happened. So I'm gonna introduce Diane Patton, who was my co-chair of the clinical group, and um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about what our fabulous, thank you, clinical group, uh, what we, we talked about in our, in our group. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Patton. I'm the Vice President for Professional Practice and Partnerships at the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. We did have a fabulous group. I want to recognize that we had clinicians uh, from internationally, which was wonderful to hear about what kinds of things they're doing, as well as uh, nurse, school nurses, uh, clinicians, and also uh, folks that were in organizations, as well as places, systems where we might have nurses employed. So I guess uh, I would like to maybe echo a little bit of what Byrne said that came out pretty loud and clear in our group in terms of the clinician is that most nurses, if they remember, did maybe get a little bit of EBP in their uh, bachelor's degree. And then certainly as they went on to school with their masters, but then when they got to their place of practicing, depending on who was in that system or whether or not they might be in a setting that did not have a structure or a system, 
they might really be out there by themselves. Now they've learned a little bit, but what do they do with this knowledge? How do they continue to practice EBP without a mentor, without structure, and really without the support? So that came through loud and clear, specifically when we were speaking about school nurses, maybe advanced practice nurses who may not be in a large system. So how do they keep that enthusiasm? So they've learned it. How do we keep them enthused? How do we move the needle forward? So um, I guess one of the uh, ideas that came in terms of a solution might be that we link up some uh, mentors for people who might be working in similar areas or similar practice. Another idea that came to the group, and we had a little bit of discussion, was would there be a way that we could include evidence-based practice and competencies uh, with our continuing professional development so that as nurses, nurse practitioners, folks who might need those uh, continuing education, that it's tied a little bit maybe to their certification. So maybe we need to talk to some of certifying bodies to say, okay, um, we need to continue with this education. We need to continually push the envelope that folks are learning this as new things come out and then possibly using that as a mentorship way as well. Much like with advanced practice nurses that you must have uh, pharmacology credits. If you don't have pharmacology credits, then you cannot be certified. So that was just one idea. I'm going to pass it to my colleagues. We had lots of ideas, but so did these groups. So, hi, so, so my name is Dorothy Farrell. I'm from the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, um, and I was co-facilitating the academic group yesterday, and we also, um, I, I'm sure every group was really fantastic. One thing that I thought was really powerful for our group is we were very interprofessional. Besides pharmacy and nursing, we had representatives from dentistry and from medicine, and that actually turned out to be really important and actually speaks to the last point that Diane said about the different training across disciplines that actually really becomes necessary. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the, the barriers, solutions, and ideas that our group came up with. And one of the first um, things that came right up is the barrier to EPP is related to what Diane said, that even to the extent that they're educated in it, they go out to practice. And even a lot of their education in practice is where it's not happening. And so really, you know, students will perform as they are taught, and they're, they're not being taught enough of it now and not practice-based. Um, one thing that, that really closely relates to this, I think, was language. There's not yet a shared language on what EVP is. People are using the same words to mean different things, um, and I think especially across professions, and then sometimes using different words to mean the same thing. And so there's a lack of understanding what EVP is. Um, there's too much leaning on research and not enough leaning or understanding of the importance of the patient making it patient-centered and about the clinical expertise aspects of it. Um, and so since, and it's even worse across professions, but even within, when people don't understand what it is, they can't act it, and when they don't act it, they can't teach it. Um, and so we thought that, that this lack of understanding led to the other big problem that people really highlighted, which was resistance from faculty, where they looked at EVP as an added mandate, as something that was just another thing to do, that they already are very crowded in their curriculum, they're already overburdened and they're not understanding EVP as something that's actually an opportunity and a savings um, and something that should be integrated into all of their practice and their practice in teaching as well as in clinical practice um, and so that that increases the resistance and so that in some sense um, confronting the issue of what EVP is and increasing understanding I think would we thought would kind of overcome some of the, the resistance. Um, one of the, the other things that became important is in teaching that it not be taught as a separate hang-on thing, like I do all my courses and then I do EVP, but that it be integrated into every aspect of the education and the training didactic and, and practice, and that there are opportunities, and especially the interprofessional aspects were so important, since that's just coming online in a lot of those competencies, that the EVP can be built into that from the outset and become like an area of strength or a foundational area for EVP. Um, and increasingly, I guess, practice is going to be interprofessional anyway, so this could be like a firm spot on which to grow. Um, and so for, for all of these issues about how to do this education, how to do interprofessional, uh, a role for the full that came up was exemplars, that um, mentoring was already mentioned um, in, the act, in the 
clinical practice, but it's needed as well for, for education and for also training the trainers, that the educators need mentors, and that that could be a role for the fool, is to bring together these exemplars both in people and in practices um, in the formation of, of a toolkit, and that could include um, somebody from OSU actually mentioned that they felt they were well positioned to maybe do like a joint course between all the different professions. And once that's established, the fool can promulgate that. It'd be really well positioned. Um, and so being, and whether you like to think of it as a clearinghouse or a warehouse, but a place where, where you know, faculty workshops can be run and curricula for workshops could be held and, and where um, active learning could be promoted and the idea of um, consultative um, services. So not just guidelines or information, but things that are really active and that would help the community really learn, especially in the other two legs of of EDP, clinical expertise, and the patient preference, which it, it seemed to be there was consensus that those are just not appreciated enough right now and not understood. Um, and that that's really what the students need. If we think of students as they are as consumers, they deserve our best efforts. They are also the potential really to get this out to clinical practice by you know ingraining it in them. And that the way to do that is to recognize the importance of EDP, to really teach it to them, to s make sure they understand their potential role in all three legs of that stool. Um, not just for research, but for dealing with the patients, for getting the clinical expertise, to give them the evidence that they need um, in all cases and how to interpret evidence, not just to read out facts, but to, to look at a situation and case by case say what's the evidence that's relevant here and how to act on it. Um, and that that would be at the end, then you would get really new clinical and clinicians and practitioners who could really make EDP happen. They need mentoring, they need modeling um, from their mentors of, of as I said, the way to do it. You know, it can't just be something that's said, but they see that that's the actions that are done. Um, and then the, the one of the final big things that came up is as you tell people to do it, you have to do more than tell, you have to integrate it and you have to assess them on it and you have to come up with ways to align everybody's goals so that when you're teaching, you don't just talk about EBP, but you know, you give assignments and you give practice scenarios in which EBP is necessary, you, you know, that they really can't solve these problems and they realize, oh, when I'm out there, the best way to do this is gonna be to use EBP. And so as we align the patient and the student's goals, also the faculties and eventually the departments and the institutions as well and, and a role for the fold in, in getting accreditors together to recognize that EBP is important. Um, I think Byrne had already um, mentioned sort of like as a fifth competency mm -hmm. that's really necessary for interprofessional that convening all of the players together to, to this alignment from the patient all the way up to the institution, all actors in between, that's really when it's gonna happen. Um, and I feel like I've talked a ton already. I hope I hit all the main um, goals. But, and the other thing is there's a, a body of, of really great resources out there and to, to gather that together, to not just create new things, but to make sure things like places like, and, and um, places like QSEN have, you know, materials that can be used and to bring everybody together. And so, um, pass it along. I'm Marilyn Hockenberry, I'm the Associate Dean for Research at, at, at Duke University, and prior, prior to that I spent almost 20 years at Texas Children's Hospital and was one of the leaders of evidence-based practice there. So had the great fortune of, of serving as a, uh, a co-facilitator yesterday with Dr. Sharon Tucker, who's here somewhere um, from OSU. And our group, um, one of the things, and I, I think you've heard it already, that I was really struck with the group that although they were there supporting and representing agencies and institutions, clearly the diversity of not only their disciplines, but their own uh, clinical experience. We had a theorist there. We had researchers in the implementation science. Uh, we had our different clinicians. And all of those perspectives, not only from their agency, but from their own clinical uh, professional lives came out. And I think the richness of that was just, just uh, amazing. Our group was dissemination and implementation science. So we spent a lot of time um, and I apologize for the administrators in the audience of talking about what's wrong with, with many of our healthcare systems um, starting at the top and then kind of going down. And one of the things I think that really struck all of us and one of our, our members of the panel talked about was that institutions want fast, easy, and cheap solutions. Um, and they want them right that you know right there immediately. And that we do too as implementation scientists, but that often, um, as we know, the complex types of problems that EVP addresses and implementation science addresses, as well as the complex healthcare systems, that's not always attainable, and there's, a, there's much to be done there to help with that. 
They're also, because of our theorist base, and we had a couple other individuals that were scientists in the, in the group, talked about the lack of understanding of how theory can really frame research, and then research goes on to quality uh, improvement initiatives, and there's a, a great dis, uh, disconnect there. And um, I, I think over and over again in all of the groups, there was a lot of discussion about um, not only do we need to look at that teaching individuals the evidence-based practice and implementation um, science process, but at the organization level, there's a disconnect in helping them understand the importance of the process from a, from a, a system-wide um, perspective. And then we came back, but the bottom line is, if that information isn't available to the individuals in the trenches and the people doing clinical care, really is it gonna impact um, the, the outcomes of patients. So there's at the big level and the little level and how do we really get those together. We also talked about consumers um, and the importance of really having them buy in. And there were some great rich stories that came out about the fact, and sometimes we forget this, that sometimes consumers don't want the evidence. They want what they always get. They go in and why aren't you giving us a prescription or why aren't you doing this? And there was great discussion, which we all live in that, you know, as, as evidence-based practice specialists, why wouldn't they want the evidence? Well, there was great discussion that I think some of us had some ahas about the fact that um, we really need to stop and determine what they want and why do they want that. Um, and, and then there was a lot of discussion that back to the clinician level of building that trust and building that kind of environment where you may have to change their own impression of what always was and what um, they should have. And that impact, and it goes back to some of our recommendations for the Fold Institute of helping consumers understand and getting that evidence out there to them because sometimes it isn't or it's distorted. Um, then we came to some cool kinds of names for individuals that the fold might mentor. We talked about practice facilitators are needed, individuals who are knowledge brokers that can be out there at all levels to be able to bring that knowledge, and champions in the workforce, and I know many of us across the nation are using those, but would it be great for the fold to really um, kind of um, be the center for us for education. Just like everybody else, um, one thing somebody said I thought was great for the Fold Institute, they could become the good housekeeping seal of EBP. Um, and that wasn't me, that was one of the, the, our great people in there. Um, we also talked about the toolbox, but not reinventing the wheel, but put things into the toolbox. And then promoting team science boot camps were talked about, that that Fold Institute might have something like that, that many of us could come to or send other people, and that basically to, to train implementation scientists of the future would, wear, would be a major, major contributor for that. Let me stop there. Good morning. My name is Michelle Trosett, and I'm a nurse, and I'm the president of the National Academies of Practice. And I had the privilege of co-chairing the Organizational Health Policy Group at the Expert Forum yesterday, along with Amy uh, McGee, who is with o the um, Health Policy Institute of Ohio. So it was great to have a social worker and president of that organization that deals with policy every single day. We had a tremendous group of individuals around the table, leaders from multiple organizations, and I think what I walked away with in Amy is the passion around policy and that everyone contributed. Um, it was really a very rich dialogue that we had yesterday. One of the things that we decided to do is to start out from an appreciative inquiry perspective. Instead of starting out with the barriers, ask the question, what is working? Is anything working when it comes from integrating evidence-based practice into policy within health organizations and within, um, and within our uh, political, uh, state, national policy? And we had a couple great examples I wanted to share with you this morning. We had several, but two really struck with me. One of them is we um, had the CDC present, and one of the things they shared with us is an initiative I was not aware of called the 618 Initiative, and how the CDC is bringing together purchasers, um, policy providers, payers, to really identify six common costly health issues and 18 evidence-based 
uh, proven interventions that go along with them. And I think it's a step around that common language, common understanding across diverse um, organizations to try to really apply evidence-based practice in a meaningful way. So um, that was one example. And another example was more around the organizational, and we had a pediatric uh, nurse practitioner there, and she talked about the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. So there's examples out there where people are really coming together to try to integrate these evidence-based interventions and bring attention to them. Then we jump to barriers. And I know we were supposed to only have two, but we came up with three. <laughs> um, the first one was linking to ROI. That was the first one that came out on the table. And if when you're going to really advocate for policy, whether in your organization or with um, health policy makers, you have to have the data, which we've heard consistently the last two days. <clears throat> and we don't often take the time to invest in that and to be prepared with that. So we really identified when it comes to policy, we gotta get this ROI down. We also talked about the lack of following health outcomes over a lifetime. And that was really significant because some of us are showing evidence based in a situation or episode of care, but we're really not looking at it over a lifetime, which then could have policy implications. So we thought that was a barrier. We need to change our thinking from short-term, long-term outcomes. Uh, and we need both. Um, and then the other barrier we came up with is just the lack of knowledge around evidence-based practice. We also, like with other groups, talked about the inconsistencies. People call it EBP. Are we, do we mean the same thing? And we had a really rich conversation around the consumer's role with EBP. And um, do they even know that their values and preferences are critical to evidence-based practice being realized? And how do we help inform them? And that we really need to educate the consumer um, at, all along the way. <clears throat> when it comes to the top solutions that our group came up with, the first thing was uh, we, ne we need to connect with key people. And the US Surgeon General came up as a number one person that we need to connect with, CDC director, other national thought leaders to advocate and lead EBP initiatives. We need to identify high-ranking nurses in key roles to really talk about the significance and how to apply it to policy. We need to make EBP the easy choice and provide them with tools and advocate for that from a policy perspective. Um, another solution was uh, following this whole notion of, of uh, collective impact in that we break down the, the barriers, and Byrne mentioned that against this morning, and we come together and we collaborate, and we collaborate for policies that are gonna make EBP everywhere by 2020, 2021, 2022. <laughs> and then um, we need to create a national agenda. We talked about that too, that we really have to have a national agenda on EBP. So that made me think about how we all could do that together as well, working with the Fold Institute. Um, tomorrow, the, the uh, National Academies of Practice is uh, a policy organization of 14 different disciplines. And we're actually meeting this weekend in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and Byrne and Lynn have, uh, tomorrow there's gonna be probably about 11 fellows from the National Academy of Practice that are gonna be joining us in the afternoon. But we're forming a national policy agenda over the weekend for our fall council retreat. And how do we take what we're learning here? And I'm here and I'm looking at Dr. Evelyn Klingerman. She's the co-chair of the Nursing Academy for NAP. So again, it's connecting all the dots so we can create this amazing national agenda to integrate evidence-based practice into um, our thing. So, Byrne, I'm not doing it in 90 days, I'm doing it in 90 hours. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> then we have several things for the Fold Institute. We were busy. <laughs> Excuse me. We need to partner with key leaders, as I said before. We need to identify interprofessional thought leaders to champion. So it's not just about nursing, it's about the whole interprofessional team. The Fold Institute, <clears throat> we recommended, really defines the scope of the policy work because you can go 100 different places. So that's going to be really critical for the policy director and the policy uh, group at the Fold Institute. And then to develop a strategic plan related to that <clears throat> so that we really can move forward. 
We talked about uh, when it comes to policy, and I really have to thank Amy, the other co-lead for this, is we have to develop relationships. Everything is about relationships, and when it comes to policy, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. So what can we do uh, as a Fold Institute to begin developing key relationships with policymakers over time? That gives us a lot to think about in our different, um, wherever we are. Um, and then also, we had a great suggestion um, that I loved. Uh, Karen Cox from AAN recommended this. Why don't we start with the study that Burns showed us this morning about nursing and burnout and medical errors? Why don't we start right now from a policy perspective with beginning with the end in mind now and take one study and follow it through? And I thought that was an exceptional um, idea. We can align EBP to other hot buttons. And our last, uh, our last uh, recommendation for the Fold Institute was to tie payment incentives to EBP coverage, and that will take policy, because that will take reimbursement changes, coding changes, and you, it, we also talked about the electronic health record, which is a big animal, but it would, it would involve that as well. So those were our recommendations. Um, kind of to loop back now that we've heard from everybody uh, in the clinical group one of the things that really came up in that group in addition was sort of related to our um, good housekeeping seal of EBP um, was the fold as a, this clearinghouse sort of hub uh, where all of all of these things sort of uh, reside as the place the place to go the place to send your information to be shared um, and that we establish a way that we create um, that one central place because there's so many things going on and there's so many people that are interested in this and so many possibilities, but there, isn't, there hasn't ever been a place to bring them all together. And I think so, um, I think that's part of why the, not misinformation, but the, the disparate definitions and everybody's, you know, sort of, it reminds me of that theory on, um, you know, storming, norming, no, Forming, storming, norming, performing. I think um, I think that's kind of where we're at. It's kind of through the storming phase where everybody's sort of been out there like, oh, we've got to do this thing, and everybody's figuring it out. Now we have to get to the place where we're settling down so that we can perform. You know, um, there's just so much happening that, that that's what we're hoping the timing is such that the fold is the right place at the right time for that. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, related to what came out of the academic uh, group uh, that I think is really, really important that we, with the competencies that we have, we, um, we tested those competencies with nurses, um, but they are being utilized across organizations, across disciplines. You know, people are just using the EBP competencies for everybody. Um, they're putting them in job descriptions for their PTs, OTs, and that sort of thing. So um, we haven't tested them in those groups, but that's certainly, you know, the opportunity is there. But meanwhile, while we're waiting, people are just doing it, which is, um, you know. And so the idea that evidence-based practice is a shared competency, I think is one of the things we heard across, that it's, it's a great opportunity to just this once not do it siloed. <laughs> We just once in my lifetime not do it in a way that we figure out what we're all talking about at the patient's bedside. You know, well, I think it's this and I think it's, in, and patients are like, well, who's in charge of what's happening to me? So a shared competency um, as we teach it and as we do it, at, you know, in real practice. Um, the other thing is um, I love the idea and I wanted to add to the idea of students as ambassadors for EBP as we as we help faculty learn what EBP, and I know Byrne um, has quoted this quote, who's from a colleague of ours, uh, faculty can't teach what they don't know. I'm here to tell you there's a whole bunch of faculty doing exactly that. There are people teaching EBP that haven't ever taken a class. Who would teach a pathophysiology course if they never took a pathophysiology class, ever? <laughs> How dare, they would be like, "Not I could never oh my God, I would never even think of doing that. Well, that kind of thinking is going on across our academic scene. And so they, it really should be teachers or faculty shouldn't teach what they don't know rather than they never would. So, I, so there's a real opportunity. So as we do a better job of teaching faculty, we do a better job of teaching students. And what I, I want to uh, loop to some of my colleagues who are doing nurse residency programs, Donya, 
are champions of uh, nurse residency programs, what we're seeing in clinical practice in hospitals. Students are coming out with EBP knowledge and they're going right into these residency programs where EBP is beautifully embedded. And guess what? They get some time to actually work on these EBP initiatives, which is what nobody else gets. And guess where the best EBP work is coming out of in hospitals right now? Nurse residency programs. Unbelievable, beautiful work. Because they're learning it and we're celebrating it and engaging it and loving it upon arrival. And then residency's over. Now the real world starts. You know, then you get to go to meet the, the real people. So I'm just saying, we are making, so teaching it right, creating students who get it, and then embracing it in the clinical environment. So we are, is this appreciative inquiry I'm doing right now? I can't believe it, because usually I'm like, what are the barriers? So it, there are some really good things going on. So I just wanted to kind of, from all the things we've heard, there are good examples of, of what's happening. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we found in terms of as we reported out yesterday, there were things we heard over and over. Um, that are sort of, the, as Byrne would say, the low-hanging fruit. What are those low-hanging fruits that we could do that would really serve across all the groups that met and ultimately also serve the consumers? And I think the idea of the fold serving as a clearinghouse, a central place, the hub, um, as we, when we first got the, uh, the, the gift, we were like, well, how are we gonna shorten the name so we have an easy way of saying, come be a part of us? And we said, I said, come into the fold. Oh, that's nice. Gather you in, you know, <laughs> I, mm, like I love that. you up, right? <laughs> so come into the fold and, and what wonders you'll find here, you know? So um, uh, I love the idea of the uh, good housekeeping. We talked a little bit about that in our, our clinical group too was, um, and then how does that, once you get that seal of approval, what does that mean? Can that help you with, you know, related to your getting your, your personal certification or your Department of Health certification or, one of the things we talked about, Kevin from Sloan Kettering, is like the Department of Health comes and says, we want you to do this for falls, and then Joint Commission comes and they say, we want you to do something else for falls, and then yeah. Magnet comes and says, we want you to do something. It's like, stop, what is, the, what is the evidence on what we should be doing for falls? And then once we know that, they should all be happy with that. You know, how do we take the evidence and push it back to the people who are asking you to do it eight ways instead of the one way that we know is right? And so, um, you know, how do we do that in the fold so then we, we, so the regulators come to us and say, how do we regulate evidence-based practice in a way that everybody's doing the right thing all the time and you all get good, great, you all get, you know, good things for that. So were there any other synergistic kind of things that you, you heard yesterday that I haven't um, brought up here that I think, um, oh, I think that point about the consumers don't really want the evidence that's a really, I hadn't heard that yesterday, I might have been just missed it, but, you know, and examples of that, I, I'm an OB person, and I think about what we were doing with uh, elective C-sections. You know, it was like, I really want this baby out, I'm, you know, it's like, yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> but, and so we were, we were, you know, we were delivering people like 37 weeks, because it's almost Christmas, you know, and you really want to be home for Christmas. <laughs> Until we got, right, it was like, I can't miss Christmas. And so we were delivering babies at 37 weeks just because, yeah, mom wanted to be done, you know. And then we started to get the, you know, the baby data on, uh, you know, late preterm births. And they're not a good idea. But, you know, p we had to be able to go back to consumers and say, I know you want to have this baby now. But here's why. For the baby, if the baby got a vote, the baby would say, it's swell in here. <laughs> I, I, I'm, ha I'm really still liking it in here, I'm not ready. Can't really breathe right yet. And so, you know, but that data is what pushed back that consumer push to say 37, 38, 39, what's the difference? When we knew what the difference was, it helped us to push back mm -hmm. and say, actually the right thing to do is to be pregnant all the way so the end. Now, whoever said you're pregnant for nine months, that's the person who should be shot because you're really pregnant for 10. <laughs> 40 weeks is 10 months, right? That's one of the evidence-based things we could push out right now. <laughs> it's not nine months. We're setting them up to be like, well, tick tock, you know. All right. So um, I want to stay on time, but um, anything else that you found were sort of the, uh, 
things that uh, we wanted to, not only what we are gonna do with the fold, but I think the other important thing that we wanted to come out of this is, what can we partner with in the fold to bring, you know, to make sure, to, to get the other organizations, not just the ones who are here, but uh, beyond that, you know, other organizations, how do we partner in a way that we can help other organizations to, to make this, you know, the national movement like you're talking about. So it's not, what are all the things we're gonna do, but what are the things that we can do that can facilitate relationships and synergies? Language is the only thing that, yeah. that I think mm -hmm. came up is, is promoting a shared language, and mm -hmm. even if that becomes yeah. as part of the mentoring, you know, because that also came up across the board, I think that that would go a long way, so that yeah. everybody's kind of having the same conversation, yeah. um, or making sense in the same conversation. And then we also talked, along with the language, this clearinghouse mm -hmm. or a place um, to store uh, templates, toolkits, again, so that things are standardized, so that if <coughs> once you get all your partners involved, whether it's the academic uh, institutions or agencies or your healthcare systems or the individual practitioner, they know where to go and everybody's going to have the same uh, materials. And I also think what came out of that is good places to share things. So we talked about um, you know, creating a clearinghouse for best evidence. And you know, so that instead of every single hospital and health care organization trying to look at, we need to do a project on what should we be doing for CAUTI? Because uh, every time we have an emergent, somebody in the, gr in the room wants to figure out what we should be doing for CAUTI. And I'm like, you don't even, you don't know that yet? Like, so instead of 5,000 people working on that project, we would, we would do that and we would have it in our clearinghouse and you would just come there and say, what is the best practice? So trying to create evidence in very, um, I call it like grab and go, you know, grab and go kind of evidence that you know is good. We've done a great job. So um, kind of like, you know, what, what, you, what you can just take and put into practice. So it speaks to that implementation piece where once we know it is and we keep that refreshed all the time. I can't even, what number's on that paper? I can't see it. Five, okay. <laughs> the people with the time no signs need to sit up front. Um, yeah. Oh, look at Opperman, there you go. She speaks loud and she has big loud signs too. So, um, so the other thing, you know, like having rubrics for things and templates for things and other good ideas that people are doing out there, you know, share them in a centralized place. Not that we're inventing everything, but we're creating a place where, where good stuff is for yeah. everybody. And that helps with this shared language yeah. that, um, cause w if what you send us is an EBP, cause I go a lot of places and they're like, here's our EBP project. And I'm like, trying to find it. <laughs> Not really, like it's, it's something else. And then when I talk to them, they're doing something else down on another unit. And that thing they're doing on the other unit is EBP. You know, they just don't know it yet, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so the clearinghouse, we also talked about how do you make the clearinghouse and the stuff in there um, accessible. So we talked about creating, you know, apps and, you know, really different ways of getting the information out for all different generations. And then I think one of the, the really profound things that somebody said was, you can do all the apps you want in the world and you can do all those things. But when my mother, who she said was like 90, gets healthcare, she just wants to know what the doctor told her to do. You know what I mean? Like, it's st there's still that, there is, there are some people that no matter what you put in front of them, if the doctor told me to, you know, wear a pink hat and sing Yankee Doodle, that's what I'm doing. So we have to get at that. It's a very multi-generational um, way that we have to approach yeah. um, how do we bring evidence out into the public, yeah. Another thing that came up yesterday in the policy group was, and I, I'm really keen on the, uh, the fourth aim and the research that you're sharing and moving from triple aim to quadruple aim, but some of the organizations are, and I've seen it not just here yesterday talking about it, but last week in another setting is we are we're going to implement things that are not evidence based so well-being what is that and someone in our group yesterday shared that they have to do mandatory physicals now and it's almost going back to this mental model of you know of physical clinical well-being versus holistic having it be um, you know uh, 
about work and life and ha having it be, so I think we're kind of at risk. So I'm thinking with the study and the Fold Institute when it comes to well-being, mm -hmm. you could play a significant role to make sure whatever we're doing related to that, it's evidence-based. So right. that came up too. So the other thing, uh, Michelle, that your group also took on was policies in hospital, like in organization, not just the national policy mm -hmm. stuff, and there was some good dialogue about that. Um, and there are some, it makes, it reminds me to say the other thing I think that the fold can serve as are where are the best practices? Mm -hmm. You know, because we, I know there are people are sitting right in our midst here. Mm -hmm. um, there are different people who are doing amazing things related to EBP in their places. And, you know, um, not, I, I mean, I, I talk about them all the time, but how could you have those places? Like if you're trying to work on what's the best way to do evidence-based policies and procedures in your organization, you could, you know, click on that and we can connect you with great people and the kinds of things they're doing. So, mm -hmm. um, similar thing with residency programs. And then making sure that we also keep in mind, um, as Diane was saying, beyond hospitals, what are we doing for public health? nurses. What are we doing for school nurses who are all by themselves? They're all by themselves. It's not like you, you know, we create an EVP mentor and they come mentor you all day long. She's like, nobody comes to see the school nurse because they're too busy running from one school to another, you know? So how do we, how do we package these things in ways that get to public health nurses and not just nurses, but school nurses and the uh, independent practitioners, you know? Um, so lots of good dialogue about making sure that we are um, packaging things for organizations, for individual clinicians, for regulatory bodies, um, and uh, many different ways to sort of crosswalk um, mm -hmm. how to be that clearinghouse. So um, that's something that we take away as a very strong message in all this. That that's very, very needed. Very, very needed. And, and we, we kind of had a vision for that as, as we started to think about this, but it came through loud and clear that, um, that that's what we need to do. As, Part of many other things, but we certainly will go down that, that road. So I have one quick question I want to ask all of you, okay? So just rapid dating on this question. So um, what, would, um, what would an evidence-based U.S. healthcare system look like? Like what would it take? <laughs> These are the high-end people. We, we, but I mean, what, what would that, as a nurse practitioner, what would that feel like for you like that that you you did you got to a point where you knew all the things you were doing and the people around you and that your patients actually were getting evidence-based care for sh for real well I, I guess um for me as as a family nurse practitioner when i think about evidence-based practice and it really we talked a little bit about it and it certainly goes with the clinician well-being that it, it would look different it would not be sick care it would really be about prevention of illnesses and promotion of health. And I think that nurses in general um, approach all patients with that mindset. We have been educated to look at the whole person uh, holistically, and so we've never approached a patient most often like, okay, you're sick, this sick, sick. We are really looking at all of the things that have contributed there. So. That's, that would be my answer. Okay, academics. Um, so, I mean, obviously everything that was just said was true. The first thing that ran to my mind is that the care would be better and really wouldn't cost anywhere near as much and would be way more accessible to you at the point that you were rather than being very prescribed about what could be done where, but that you would get the effective care at the moment where you were and you really wouldn't be paying so much. Okay. I'm starting to say the same thing, <laughs> but um, holistic and well, wellness focused. The American U.S. health system would be the best system in the world. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Right. I have, I have one, Lynn. I yes. have just one more. I just want to share one more thing. Um, some of you may not know, but Dr. Lynn Gallagher Ford was inducted as a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing two weeks ago. I'm in a picture of persistence on that, so just keep that in <laughs> mind. So it takes good sponsors to get you there. So I appreciate all of the people who helped me do that. And so, and I tried to be very quiet during my uh, my first meeting there. I was taking it all in, thinking, "Oh boy, this is going to be fun." So, 
<laughs> I'll be the, you'll be, the, who is this woman? How did she get in? So they'll be, ba they'll be back. Okay, so I wanted to thank all of our folks that came to the, the uh, forum yesterday, the, all the great conversation that went on, our fabulous leadership group, our fabulous scribes who helped write everything down. And uh, please be assured that um, we take very seriously what, what we've heard. That was the whole point of, of this is to, to hear it and not just think it up in our own heads because that's exactly what we don't want other people to do. So um, this is the beginning of our uh, collection of evidence to support what we will become. And so um, as, as you come into the fold, um, you have a, a little bit of an idea of what you can expect uh, to, to see there. And uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And so we're going to take another break now, right? No, no, we're not taking Recovery. Quick break. Up and stretch. We'll be back in five minutes.
All right, we're going to make attempts to get ourselves back on schedule, so please come on in and take your seats. I'm hearing from so many people about the richness of the networking. We love that. It's probably the number one reason why some of us are here. Good. Got that changed. No, what is it? It said evidence based. And all the pictures said that. I'm like, do you want to have Good. All right, could we have everybody take their seats so that we can get started on our next presentation? Thank you, Kathleen. We got, we got, got to get the person the right job. Okay, so I am. Is is Arlene here? I, I know she's here. I mean, is she back? I'm waiting. I'm talking to the mic. Okay. I'm just going to wait a minute till our next speaker gets back in the room. Some networking going on out there, apparently. What? Tell some jokes? My specialty? <laughs> Do not give me open mic night, or you may never get it back, so. <clears throat> All right. Somebody go get Arlene. Oh, you're on it, Kim? Okay. Because we have no time to waste. We got to move, move, move. Yes. Today? Okay, so one of the things while we're waiting, um, while we're uh, during lunch, we're going to be giving out some awards for our national. Um, National, what was it called? National Challenge winners. So um, please uh, bring your lunch in here so you, we have a, a nice audience for those people to uh, receive their appropriate accolades. Uh, we had, um, in preparation for the summit, about a year ago, we had a call for a national challenge um, for people to submit amazing uh, work they were doing in EBP. And we had some incredible submissions and we have some really incredible winners. And then we also had our call for abstracts for all our other pre uh, folks who are presenting and doing posters. So um, while I have a moment, I want to thank all the people who did those reviews for us. You know who you are. So the people who um, read through hundreds and hundreds of um, you know really incredible um, submissions, I want to thank you for. That's a lot of work. And uh, so you did a great job. OK, so we are going to move on to our next presentation. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Arlene Bierman. <clears throat> Arlene Bierman, MD, MS, is director of AHRQs, everybody knows what that is, Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement, which consists of the Evidence-Based Practice Center Program, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force Program, the Division of Decision Science and Patient Engagement, the Division of Health Information Technology, and the Division of Practice Improvement, and the National Center for Excellence in Primary Care Research. Such an underachiever. <laughs> That's a big job. That's a big job. Dr. Bierman is a general internist, geriatrician, and health services researcher whose work is focused on improving access, quality, and outcomes of health care for older adults with chronic il uh, illnesses in disadvantaged populations. As a tenured professor, she held appointments in health policy, evaluation and management, public health, medicine, and nursing at the University of Toronto, where she was the inaugural holder of the Ontario Women's Health Council Chair in Women's Health and a senior scientist in the Lee Ka Shing Knowledge Institute at St. Michael's Hospital. She received her MD degree from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, where she was a Moorhead Fellow 
She completed fellowships in outcomes research at Dartmouth Medical School and community and preventative medicine at Mount, Sin Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She also served as an Atlantic Philanthropies Health and Aging Policy Fellow, American Political Science Foundation Congressional Fellow. So there you go. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down now and uh, welcome Arlene to the stage. So. Good morning. I am so thrilled to be here. What ex an exciting, exciting, and what you, you know, I think of the highlight of all that, I was a professor of nursing. And, <laughs> and I taught evidence-based practice to nurses. So this, I really feel at home here, and I'm just so excited about this meeting. So we know, we've been talking about getting evidence into practice, and I just thought by summarizing all the things that happen because we don't use evidence. So what's wrong with our health system? We treat patients too late. We treat everybody the same way. There's a huge variation in quality. You all know all of this. We treat patients in our own silos. Um, we don't know what really works. I mean, we're talking about evidence, but there's huge gaps in the evidence as well. Um, there's medical errors are all too frequent, even though we've made improvements as a nation. And uh, workflow is irrational. And patients, they don't do what we tell them to do. They're not here. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the good news is, is we're getting to the point where we really have solutions and we have ideas and we know how to fix this. And I think coming all together, we can make a big difference in, in getting the health system that the US really wants and deserves. So what are the solutions? We need to be proactive. We need to personalize medicine. We need to provide decision support. We need to integrate care. We need real world assessment. We need to generate evidence from practice as well as implementing evidence in practice. We need to monitor safety. We need to make, integrate care in ways that uh, makes workflow rational. And we also have to be partners that involve our patients. And I think that everybody here in this room is probably working on different pieces of these things. So what am I gonna talk about today? I'm gonna talk a little bit, I think we have a huge opportunity in terms of learning health systems and the recognition that that's where we need to go. And, and really closing that loop between evidence generation and evidence implementation and making that a continuous improving cycle as well. A little bit more about, I know here, evidence-based practice, we're used to doing systematic reviews, using systematic reviews. But increasingly, uh, we need to do complex um, reviews of complex interventions. And I'm going to talk a little bit of some arc, new arc work in that area. I'm going to talk about a model for learning as we implement, and some tools around getting ev um, evidence to the point of care. So I work at AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, just, I have to give my disclaimer, what I say represents me and not the federal government. But the mission of ARC, I think, is just wonderful, which is why I'm there, is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work with um, the Department of Health and Human Services and other partners to make sure that evidence is understood and used. So how do we do this? Uh, we invest in research and evidence um, to understand how to make healthcare safer and improve quality. We, cre we create materials to teach and train healthcare systems and professionals to catalyze improvements in care. And we also generate measures and data used to track and improve performance and evaluate progress in the US healthcare system. Um, and you know, in my introduction, they mentioned like the different divisions in my center. And I came to ARC about two years ago and was really impressed by the work of all of the divisions. But we too were siloed. And by aligning the work, by making sure the evidence-based practice center is aligned with implementation and, t and electronic tools, we could have a bigger impact. And I, I think the same thing goes for this um, room. We've also been tasked under the Affordable um, Care Act to do dissemination and implementation of evidence. And we have a public nomination process 
on our website. So we would really like to hear from you. If there's evidence out there that's ready for scaling across the country, let us know and we have a process to kind of evaluate that and we're gonna make some strategic investment. So I just want you to all like nominate your, your best evidence. So, you know, we all know, this is what people have been talking about all morning, the, the huge gap between what we know and what we do and how do we close that gap. And, you know, sort of the delay in getting things into praxis. This is a decade ago that the National Academies of Medicine put out this report on learning health system. And I, like, I prefer the word learning health organization because it could be a practice. It could be a, a community health center. It could be a network of practices. So we want to think about that broadly. But what's the definition? A learning health care system is one that is designed to generate and apply the best evidence for the collaborative health care choices of each patient and provider to drive the process of discovery as a natural outgrowth of patient care and to ensure innovation, quality, safety, and value in health care. And so a learning health system systematically gathers and also creates evidence. And it applies the most promising evidence-based practices to improve care. And what are the components? What are the hallmarks? Leaders are committed to a culture of quality improvement. Um, so I've heard a lot of talk about culture here is really key. Evidence is systematically gathered and applied. Clinicians receive new evidence via IT, information technology. We use new tools. Clinicians cite evidence in shared decision making with patients. Data on care is analyzed, used to improve care. And outcomes consistently are assessed, protocols reevaluated, and continuous feedback cycle for quality improvement. So, you know, just a little bit here, this picture I think illustrates the loop um, between, you know, evidence generation and evidence implementation. That basically we have biomedical research, other sorts of research that provide the evidence, and we apply the best evidence for each. Um, available patient. I think this highlights the partnership between clinicians and patients. But at the point of care, we generate evidence, we evaluate, we decide did this work or not, and we learn how to do things better. So this slide um, is from Chuck Friedman at the um, University of Michigan. I thanked him for letting him use it. But he's about the whole, the, there's a whole ecosystem of knowledge that we have to um, apply. And what he basically says, is that, um, thank you. Ah, now I can see you guys. <laughs> I, I am vertically challenged, I have to admit. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but I think I love this, you know, this figure that he created because it really says that evidence is the keystone on which um, a learning health system is founded. And we take the knowledge, and then we have K2P, which we take the knowledge to performance or practice. And then we take the performance, and we ge generate data from it, and then that data to create new knowledge. And that's the cycle. So you guys are the first ones who are seeing this. And I don't think it um, projects that well. But this is something we've been working at at ARC, and um, along with Victor Montori, who's uh, with us part-time on an IPA. And we've developed this new model, which we're calling the care and learn model. And I'd love your impact, you know, um, input on this. But, you know, basically what we decided is there's lots of models out there, but this one is multifunction and it's dynamic. And it really doesn't matter which way you enter it, depending on your needs. And the idea is, is that we have the healthcare team and who deal with situations, whatever the problems of the patients are. So it could be a clinical problem like diabetes, or it could be a different kind of problem like improving population health. And, but remembering that patients spend most of their time outside of our system, in the community and the social you know, context with which they live. But when they come in, we assess um, their needs, we use evidence. Um, we use that evidence to develop a response. We adapt that response to, the, to the, the situation. And in that process, we produce evidence that lets us evaluate and continually improve. And you know that participation and partnership is really key, but that the caring is just as important as the learning. And I, that's why I'm so excited about talking to this audience, because you know, nurses get, get caring. So anyway. 
and this is also from Chuck Friedman, in terms of there's something called making um, data fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But we also want to make evidence fair. And I heard a lot of talk about this, too. How do we make it easy to find the evidence accessible when you need it, interoperable, and reusable? Um, this slide is actually um, from uh, the Journal of Nursing Care Quality. And it's really the cycle of evidence, that we take a body of evidence, we do systematic reviews, we translate the evidence into actions and tools, and then we implement the evidence in practice and we evaluate it. So there's many, many different people who have looked at this type of, of cycle. And, you know, ARC has produced tools um, and resources that are part of this knowledge ecosystem. And, you know, some of you, how many people here use the National Guidelines Clearinghouse? Wow, okay. We also have the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse. The, uh, the National Guidelines Clearinghouse has two new features. We're going to start prospectively um, this spring, um, basically rating guidelines indicating the extent to which they, um, they adhere to the, the, uh, um, the, the National Academy of Medicine um, you know, criteria for good guidelines. We've also already implemented a search function where you could find uh, which guidelines address multiple chronic conditions and comorbidities. So this, uh, this is a national resource. I think the unfortunate news is, is actually because of budget cuts, the funding is ending. So it's at risk for disappearing, and we're actively looking for public and private partners. So if you have ideas about sustainability, let me know. Um, we've also heard a lot here today about the quadruple aim, um, which is you know, better care, you know, increased value, but really better experience for patients and better experience for providers as well. And we know if we use evidence to make the system work and make it easy for people to do their jobs, they're going to be more satisfied and it's going to, you know, help, help contribute to better care and better patient experience. So um, ARC really does produce evidence about what works. And we need evidence um, for two kinds of things. We need evidence, clinical evidence, what's the best practice, but we also need evidence for how do we really improve care and what works. Um, and increasingly, we need evidence on complex interventions. So, you know, one of the centers within my center is the evidence-based practice program. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the EPC reports that do systematic reviews. We have multiple partners. And again, we take nominations from the public on, on topics that are right for systematic reviews. And increasingly, we're focusing on reviews that help support improvement um, within learning health systems. Many of you here may be systematic reviewers. You know the steps to do this. But I just want to highlight step number six is translate into action. The reason we, you know, synthesize evidence is really to make a decision. And then we need to take that evidence and actually make sure that it gets to patients and, sh and shorten the cycle for the, um, translating evidence into practice. So what's a complex um, intervention? There's multiple different types of um, complex interventions. I think the two most um, in, uh, common ones are behavioral inter interventions. How do you get somebody to exercise or lose weight or adhere to a complex um, regimen, self-management support? But there are also complex interventions or what we do to do quality improvement and, you know, ch implement new models of care. So all complex interventions have two common characteristics. Um, they have multiple components, which is called intervention complexity and complicated multiple causal pathways, feedback loops, synergies, and or mediators and moderators of effect, and that's pathway complexity. And they might have one or more of the following. They can target multiple participants, groups, or organizational levels, which is population complexity. They might require multifaceted adoption, uptake, or integration strategies, so that's implementation complexity. Or they might work in dynamic, multidimensional environment, which is a contextual com complexity. And we know some have all of the above. So I want to just alert you to this resource. I know it's, you probably can't see um, this tool there, uh, this, read all of this. But ARC and the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology just um, 
published a whole series of doing systematic reviews on complex interventions. There are seven papers that go walk through all the different um, components. They're all available online, so I just encourage you to, to know um, that that resource is there. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of what we have in that series. So basically, when you do a review on a complex intervention, you know, you have your PICOs, which you all know. But really, what is the intervention? What exactly is it? And sometimes defining it, and actually sometimes reading um, papers around quality improvement, it's hard to know exactly what they did and how they did it. Um, and so in terms of defining the questions in complex interventions, systematic reviewers use different an um, analytic to techniques to determine whether a complex intervention is effective as a, as a whole, whether a, the approach um, works in different contexts and on different subgroups of patients, whether specific components of the intervention are more or less effective than others, or whether effectiveness is driven by subsets of the components. And I'm sure this is something you struggle with all the time when you're trying to um, implement um, an evidence-based practice. Um, there's lots of challenges in doing this. There's a lack of consistent terminology. Sometimes there's questions about how do we group these interventions? Do we do it by their features or do we use a theoretical approach? Do we analyze this qualitatively or um, qualitatively? And one of the biggest challenges, I think we're, we're with complex interventions where we were with, you know, clinical trials a couple of days, you know, decades ago that we really need standardized reporting so that we know that the elements critical to understanding the success and impact and um, what methods they use to implement. And hopefully over time that reporting is going to get better to allow us to better gain the evidence from improvement interventions. In the process of re refining the scope, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I really want to say that stakeholder input is key. You know, why are we asking these questions? What do we want to know and how are we going to use it? And make sure that when we ask these questions, it's relevant. When we answer it, it's really relevant for the decision makers and the users. Um, I'm sure this is very difficult to see. Um, this is from a great paper um, by uh, Mira, and I can never pronounce her last name correctly. Um, this Lothan, anyway, she's wonderful. But <laughs> But this is in the paper in the series about, you know, different analytic strategies for doing reviews that really walks you through it in a very concrete way. But I'm just going to focus on the top circle here is what is the nature of the decision? How are we going to use this review to inform decision makers? So is the intervention effective? And the methods we use depend on what our purpose of the review is. So that might be a standard meta-analysis. But then we might want to know what works, when, and for who, when we need to start going into different types of approaches, such as qualitative comparative analysis, real synthesis, et cetera. Or we might want to know what happened when the intervention was implemented and moved to different types of mixed methods. So we need to start thinking differently about the work we do. I think for time, I'm going to skip over this one, but we want to know how effective is the intervention, for whom does it work, um, what happens when the complex interventions are implemented, and what decisions are possible based on the evidence that we gathered. Um, and the other thing I just want to alert you to, so this group developed a PRISMA extension, so to really guide reporting. And I think of these, uh, you know, interventions to improve care, and hopefully you'll all look at this extension and also use it to critique the literature. Um, when you read it and when you pull papers um, for your own evidence practice. So now I'm going to transition a little bit to give an example of, I think, which is a really exciting model of ARC learning while implementing. So are, is anybody here involved in the evidence now? Yes, some people, great. So evidence now is a really exciting project by ARC. This is its last year of funding. Um, and what it is is seven state and regional collaboratives across the U.S., and you can see the list of the collaboratives and, and on the map where they are, 
really aimed at reaching small and medium-sized primary care practice to improve management of cardiovascular risk. And it's exciting because a lot of evidence-based practice is done in the big, you know, the Kaiser's, the really big integrated Mayo integrated health systems that have the resources to do it, and a lot of the country is left behind. And what we're really showing that it's possible to do this across the country in small and medium-sized practices. So we want to really ensure that primary care practices have the latest evidence on cardiovascular health and that they use it to help patients live healthier and longer lives. And we implement evidence in primary care practice to improve um, health care quality. And it's really focused on two, four quality indicators, which you all know. It's the ABCs, aspirin, blood pressure co control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. But at the same time we're doing this quality improvement um, project, we're really building primary care practices capacity to receive and incorporate evidence in the, in the future. So hopefully the next time they tackle another issue, they'll be able to, to do it even better. But we also have a research question, and this is what we're talking about learning from implementation is, does externally provided QI support practice facilitation accelerate the dissemination and implementation of evidence in primary care? And so there's seven um, regional col um, collaboratives. We, ha we also um, awarded a grant for an external evaluation. So each of the um, collaboratives is doing their own intervention and testing it, but they've all um, decided to collect common data and common metrics. So we're going to have a national um, evaluation across all of the collaboratives using mixed methods to really learn what worked and what didn't, why and where. And we also provided technical assistance um, to the researchers and the practices. So the reach is we have enrolled 1,500 small to medium-sized primary care practices over the country, um, including 5,000 primary care professionals and 8 million patients. And I think we need to start doing things to scale if we're really going to transform the health system. It was a multi-component, evidence-based intervention based on what we know works to change practice. We use data. Um, uh, feedback and benchmarking, EHR support, shared, there was a shared learning collaborative, expert consultation, and practice facilitation on site. And so how are we going to assess outcome? We're going to look at, you know, improvement on the quality indicators, but we're also looking at practice capacity. What was the practice capacity to change? Who was able to change and who wasn't and why? And actually part of that, one of the questions asks about burnout. And we're getting a lot of anecdotal evidence that practices who started um, participating in this, people who are ready to retire in small communities because they were overwhelmed, they, they, this is restoring their joy in practice. People want to do the best they can, and it's really hard. <laughs> and um, the other thing is the mixed message eval evaluation, which I told you about. We have the baseline performance on these indicators, but what's not so important is the averages that there was huge variation. So there were practices who were already doing a good job on some of these measures. So for them, it's learning which ones where they're falling short and addressing those. And I think we need to think about this in terms of targeting interventions is that we, you know, it's hard, it's expensive to improve, and we really need to assess first and target resources to those who need it in terms of who are falling, you know, really falling behind. And I think that will help us um, implement, you know, more broadly, more quickly. So this is another, um, we all know that the opioid um, epidemic is, you know, and this is another example where we're using the same approach. So, and this started, which was great, which was an evidence report where we looked at what do we know about implementing medicated assisted treatment models of care for opioid disorder in primary care settings. And we found that there was overwhelming evidence that this works. But we also found that the biggest gap was in rural communities where um, physicians really, you know, might not have been trained, might not have had that skill set, or don't have access to the infrastructure or the social service and, psych you know, mental health um, 
services that they need. So this is using telehealth, all kinds of technology to really train. And we're, we're in four states um, across the US, um, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, um, you, uh, North Carolina, and Colorado. But we're hoping we're going to collect evidence that can, we can gather scalable evidence from this. So it's a, just another example of how we're taking this approach to improve care. So I'm going to switch gears one more time and talk a little bit about getting evidence to the point of care um, and using health information technology to do this. We've created a patient-centered clinical decision support learning network. Um, the website is there for those of you who are interested in CDS. I, I encourage you to join the network. It's open to people to join. And the network has interestingly developed a framework for implementing CDS that is very, very similar to prioritize um, one of the things we're developing, which is really exciting, is something called an authoring tool that will be available publicly, which will make it easier to author clinical decision support. And like if I go back to the knowledge ecosystem that we were talking about before, to think about um, how do we make all our evidence computable? Can you imagine if the systematic review was computable and the guideline was computable, and then you can take that and put it in an authoring tool and get your clinical decision support? I mean, I think we're at a time where the technology is there where we can use it to really support our aims for evidence-based practice. And then um, CDS, and this is called CDS Connect. So the goal is to establish a new national infrastructure for sharing clinical decision support. We're also doing a repository online so that once somebody develops it, it's accessible and shareable. And if you need it in your system, you can download it and uh, demonstrate use of the infrastructure, including developing CDS according to international standards and pilot testing in a live clinical environment. And so we're you know, building that publicly available repository of shareable CDS building blocks, which are called artifacts. And we're creating as a test case uh, a CDS for cholesterol management and testing it in a, pri in a primary care setting. And we're going to try to do this with a couple of other conditions as well. And we're going to have that open source authoring tool that I mentioned. So you know, just to kind of conclude, um, there's lots, it's, I think this is an exciting time to be embarking on an institute like this to, to expand uh, the uptake of evidence-based practice. And this is actually a, a site from NIH, which is a resource for selecting and implementing um, models and measures of implementation science. And you can go on there and find, you know, what we're saying, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Has somebody done this before and be able to pull it up? So I just want you to be aware of this resource as well. I'm going to skip this one. And just to think about from an academic perspective, we have health services research, but within that falls implementation science, dissemination research, implementation research, and it's linked to quality improvement, but there's really a science around quality improvement. So, so to think about how all of these things fit together. And this is actually um, done by Mitchell, who is at um, NCI, this framework. So I'm just going to conclude with focusing on the care and learn model again to think about how we can both care and learn. And, I, and today I've been hearing a lot about reaching out to practitioners on the front lines. And I know when, you know when I taught nurses, I would always start the class by saying, I would divide people up. Are you in ICU, ambulatory, ED, you know, med surge? And say, come up with a problem that you deal with every day. And it was amazing. And once people connected it, like, why am I doing this? Does this make sense? This doesn't, I was told to do this. And once you get people questioning, I think it's that partnership. I think sometimes with quality improvement, we go out there and we um, you know, tell people, you got to do this. But the same way we need to partner with patients, I think we also need to partner with providers. And I think once we start doing that, we're going to find a lot of answers and also a lot of questions. So I'm going to end there. Thank you.
didn't bring my agenda. To... Uh, we're, I think it's lunch. So there are, um, it, I don't know if there's anybody else that's uh, supposed to do the logistics here, but there are, the lunches are outside. Um, some are in boxes, some are more like set up your own, your own plate. Um, and if you just grab your lunch and then come on back in here, we will be doing some, of course, some fun things uh, during lunch, and then we'll be um, moving on from there. So go grab some lunch and come on back. <laughs>